Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Servants. Today's episode is going to be a bit on the darker side, as this story is one that is primarily of tragedy and sadness. You see, today's topic is not like the great prowesses of a Saito Hajime or the grand adventures of Astolfo. It's not even about adding a huge part of history. It's not even on the same level as a long-lived Cavalier Dayan who did die in tragedy in their 80s. No. Today's story is one of revolution, fire, corruption, and the fall of an empire. Today's topic is the Grand Duchess Anastasia Romanov. This episode is going to involve Anastasia, but her story is one that focuses on Russia as a whole. She was more of a victim of circumstances rather than a great hero of the throne. However, I will explain why it is that she was likely added to the throne later in this video. But I digress. Let's begin. Born on the 18th of June in 1901, Anastasia was the youngest daughter of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. Her birth was not a happy one, as the Romanovs had hoped for her son to be the heir. Despite this disappointment, she was raised happily along with her elder sisters Olga, Tatiana, and Maria. Despite the royal status, the Romanovs did not coddle their children to become spoiled. They slept on hard cots and taught them to knit. They would then donate their knitting during charity events. Together with her sisters, she formed a family nickname, Atma, composed of the first letters of their name, which is what they would sign letters collectively as. Of her sisters, Anastasia was considered both the most charming, but also the most, quote, impish, end quote. She was a little prankster, putting rocks into snowballs, violent when playing, and had little care for the fact that she was the daughter of royalty. However, she and the other Romanov children would suffer from health issues, likely due in large part to the incestuous nature of the European royals. Anastasia had a poor back and bunions on both of her feet. Remember, she is not an older woman, she is a child when this is happening. So this is very much a cause for concern. But it would not be her health issues that invited the most problems to the Romanovs. On the 12th of August, 1904, the Romanovs would get their wish and have a son named Alexei. This wish came with a heavy price, as the boy was incredibly sickly and suffered from hemophilia. In order to help their son and only male heir, they employed the help of a holy man, whose deeds were making the rounds amongst the nobles. A filthy bumpkin, who walked all the way to Greece, saw that the Christians in a monastery were participating in homosexual activities, then walked back to Russia. Look it up, this is true. Grigory Rasputin. I will eventually be forced to do an episode on Rasputin, as he is a figure present in FGO, and we will very likely get him as a servant in the near future. However, I'm not tackling that enormous beast until that happens. So for the time being, I recommend listening to the last podcast on the left's four-part series on the man. They cover him in a way that is significantly better than I ever could. I am not affiliated with them in any way, just a big fan of their work. They also have a series on Helena Blavatsky, so check them out. To make an extremely complex man simple, I will describe Rasputin in three words. Big, horny, wizard. Let me explain this for all of you who just had the thought of Rasputin x Anastasia was a thing. Rasputin was quite literally a cock wizard. He claimed to have visions during sex and took on as many partners as he could. He claimed it to be a burden that he had to bed so many women and that he did it in pursuit of becoming a better man. Let's just let that sink in for a bit, knowing that he is a pseudo-servant to Kotomine. It is unknown how, but Rasputin was a man that appeared to be able to perform miracles. He somehow managed to subdue Alexei's hemophilia simply by speaking with him, even over the phone. There are a lot of theories as to how he pulled it off, but how a peasant could figure out something that the best physicians at the time could not is absolutely beyond me. To Anastasia and the rest of the Romanovs, he was known simply as our friend. He was kind to the children who only had good things to say about him. However, due to him being permitted around the children when they were in their bedgowns, one of their nurses would eventually complain, concerned that he may do something inappropriate given his reputation. In response, Queen Alex had her fired. In retaliation, the nurse went to tell the extended family of the Romanovs her concerns. Unlike the direct family, the extended family had not fallen under the charismatic spell of Rasputin, and as such, rumors began to circulate about Alec and Rasputin having an affair, as well as Rasputin with all of the children. Mind you, there is no evidence to support these claims, but as a result of all the bad press, Tsar Nicholas had Rasputin sent away for a while. However, he would eventually be brought back due to him being the only one who could cure Alexei. Things only got worse during the onset of World War II. For those who do not know, 
Russia's grand strategy in most wars is something like this. Throw as many soldiers and peasants at the enemy until they retreat, and if they don't retreat, burn down the town and move to the next one. It did not help that Tsar Nicholas was not exactly a prolific general, so this was his go-to strategy. Now, the people who this affects the most are, of course, the peasants and the working class people. As we know in history, post-World War II, we see the working class revolution in the founding of the Soviet Union. The Romanov girls would attempt to show good faith to the soldiers by assisting them as nurses and tending to their injuries. Given that Maria and Anastasia were too young to be Red Cross nurses, they instead opted to raise morale by playing games with the soldiers. However, the Russian monarchy would eventually fall out of favor, and the Bolshevik party would take control. The Romanovs, Anastasia included, would be kept under house arrest. They would eventually be moved to Siberia to keep them safe, but out of the public eye. Despite the dire times, they would still try and find ways to enjoy themselves. Anastasia in particular was well liked by the guards and seemed to always be able to elicit a laugh from her family, regardless of the mounting dread. These moments of peace must have been the world to the young girl and her family. However, the time had come. While Russia's civil war raged on, the Bolshevik army and party leaders knew that if they had wanted to maintain a foothold in Russia, they had to remove the figurehead. So long as a member of the Romanovs lived, the White Army may place them as an heir and try and reinstate the monarchy. Thus, the family was rounded up by guards under the pretense that they were to be moved to a safer location. They dressed and gathered at the basement of their current residence. Then, a group of guards appeared and informed Nicholas that he and his family were to be executed. The final Tsar of Russia's last words were nothing more special than, What? He was then shot in the chest several times, and the other guards opened fire upon the rest of the family. The basement filled with smoke from the guns, and soldiers charged the family, spearing them with bayonets, and when everything had finally cleared away, the Romanovs had perished. Their bodies were loaded up into a cart, and eventually thrown into a ditch on the side of the road. Anastasia was only 17 years old. But what was so special about Anastasia? I'm sure that you listening to this must be wondering that as well. If you were to ask anyone on the street if they knew who Anastasia of Russia was, some people would know, if not most. If you were to ask the ones who did know if they could name any of her sisters, I bet you that nobody could. Maybe like three of them could. Well, aside from the Don Bluth movie, which is amazing, Anastasia is known for supposedly surviving this massacre. These claims come from a number of women claiming to actually be Anastasia and offering a variety of ways how they made it out alive. The most famous of these was a woman by the name of Anna Anderson who claimed that she had escaped by feigning death and the guard carrying her, taking pity upon her. She would claim to be Anastasia until the day that she died. However, after DNA testing, it came back conclusive that she held no relation to the Romanovs. The site where the corpses were abandoned was found and exhumed in 1991. However, two of the bodies were missing, one of which was Anastasia's, as none of the ones found showed immature features, and Anastasia had several due to her young age. This bolstered the claim that she had survived. Despite this, in a claim made in a letter called the Yurovsky Note, two of the bodies were removed and cremated to make it harder for loyalists to identify and possibly venerate the burial site. Lo and behold, two burned bodies were found in 2007 at a site near Yekaterinburg. They were of a young boy and a late teens girl. After running a DNA test on the bones, they were identified as Alexei and one of his sisters. The body's stature matched that of Anastasia. These bones are currently held by the Orthodox Church after the Romanovs were canonized as saints, making Anastasia a member of the Chaldean Saints Club. Like I said, this is not a happy story, but I do want to touch on an interesting part of Anastasia's design and fate, her noble phantasm. Technically, Anastasia has two, one that we see in-game and one that we don't. The one that we do not see in-game is that she is able to recreate the Kremlin, which was the giant fortress of the Russian royalty. Any who enter it who were not invited are viewed as enemies, and Anastasia has complete control of everything that goes on inside. But I want to look at the one that does appear in-game. It's called VVV, and the spirit of V possesses the doll that she carries around with her. But what is V? V comes from a story by Nikolai Gogol about three students who take lodging at the home of an old woman. The story primarily focuses around one of them named Koma. While he sleeps, the old woman approaches him and climbs onto his back. She hits his legs with a broomstick and he is magically compelled to run. He is taken on something like a dream quest to a magnificent land 
but he is treated as a horse. Through the use of chanting prayers, he is able to remove the witch from his back, throwing her to the ground. He then beats her to death with a log. The old woman's form changes to that of a beautiful young woman. As time goes on, rumors begin to circulate that Koma killed the daughter of a Cossack chief. Her last wish was supposedly to have Koma pray over her dead body for three nights. He tries to run, but is captured and brought to do his task by the Cossacks. He is then left alone in the church with the coffin. While he waits, the corpse comes alive and begins to approach him. However, he draws a magical circle around himself, which the corpse is unable to cross. The corpse returns to the coffin, and the coffin begins to wildly fly around the room until the call of the rooster sounds. The next day, he draws another magical circle, prompting the witch to try and scratch at him, but is unable to reach him due to the barrier. Instead, she summons demons and monsters that scratch at the windows and wall until the call of the rooster comes. The final night, the witch calls upon her demons to summon the evil spirit V, a creature able to see all things. It is described as such. The squat V is hairy, with an iron face. Bespattered all over with black earth, its limbs are like fibrous roots. It has long drooping eyelids that it commands to be lifted so that it may locate Coma. Despite his better judgment, he watches the whole ordeal. And this allows the V to locate him and command the spirits to kill him, which they do. Folklorists have tried to identify the origins of the V, but it appears to be an invention solely of the author despite the claims that he is a folkloric king of the gnomes. In the lore of FGO, V was a spirit that existed along with the Romanovs and formed a contract with Anastasia as she lay dying, hence why they are summoned together. In Fate, V possesses a mystic eye that is able to detect weaknesses as well as enemies within the confines of Anastasia's domain. A fun little mood lightener is that Anastasia becomes a bit more of her classic prankster self when she becomes her summer version, also, V gets three costume changes as well, which is very cute. But that's it. I kind of feel bad doing this one and not talking about Anastasia as much, but honestly, there's not much to be said about her that can't just be summarized like that. Her passing away at such a young age makes it so that it's very hard to study just her as a person. However, the legacy of her family is certainly one that lives on to this day. But that's it. Thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video, let me know in the comments. If you'd like to request me to do a specific servant, let me know about that as well. Like the videos, it really does help out the channel. Subscribe to catch these videos as they go up, and follow my Twitch for significantly less structured content. Same goes for the Twitter. But until next time, keep your chin up. Peace.